Hi everyone, I'm Nick Olivo, and today we're doing an overview of the Pathfinder 2nd Edition character sheet for Roll20. And the idea here is, if you're a GM who has a new player, maybe they're new to Pathfinder, or maybe they're just new to Pathfinder on Roll20, this video will give them an overview of where everything lives on their character sheet and how it works, so that come game night, they'll be able to navigate their character sheet with confidence. So I'm going to put a link down in the video description with a timestamp in it that you can share with your player and it will take them right to the spot in the video where we start talking about the character sheet so they can review that, get a feel for how everything works, and then they'll be good to go. Before we dive in, I'd just like to thank Roll20 for sponsoring this video. So let's get you acquainted with your character sheet. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to make attack and damage rolls, how to do spells and saving throws, we'll see how to do skill checks, as well as a few other things along the way. Let's dive in. Now you probably already know that you can open your character sheet by going over to the journal tab and then clicking on your character name. But you can also open your character sheet by holding down the Alt key on your keyboard and then double clicking on your token. That will open up your character sheet, and then we can resize it to what's comfortable for us and get ready to use it. One other thing to mention is that when the character sheet is full size, it does usually block the view of your map. So you can minimize your character sheet just by double clicking on the title bar here, and that tucks your character sheet away, and when you're ready to use it again, you can just double click on it to bring it back to full size. Let's minimize it for right now and take a look at what's going on on the battlefield. So as we can see, our party is getting into a fight with these kobolds. When combat breaks out, the first thing your GM is going to ask you to do is roll initiative. So what they'll do is open up this turn order window, and then they'll roll initiative for the bad guys. And just so you know, if you hover over an entry in the turn order window, you can see which bad guy that represents. Now, we want to add our character's turn to the initiative order window. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure our character's token is selected. And then, bring back our character sheet. We're going to make sure that we're on the character tab. And then we're going to scroll down, and over here on the right-hand side, you're going to see this perception area. In here is an initiative button. And right next to that button is this drop-down that lists all the skills that you could use when rolling initiative. Typically, when you're rolling initiative, you're rolling a perception check, and the drop-down defaults to that. But if you were using a different skill, say you were sneaking along, then you would choose stealth from the drop-down. And you can always double-check with your GM if you're unsure about which skill to use, but once you've got the appropriate skill selected, click the initiative button, and your initiative will be rolled and added to the turn order. We can see it right here in the chat, and we can see it's been added to the turn order. And it's important to note that you need to have your character's token selected before you roll initiative. If you don't, it will not add the character's initiative to the turn order. Once everyone has rolled initiative, our GM will sort the turn order window, and whoever rolled highest goes first. So, looking at the turn order window, I can see that my character Valeros gets to go first. And on his turn, he can perform three actions. A listing of every possible action you can do is found in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Core Rulebook. But for right now, what we're going to do is have Valeros spend one of his actions to move up to this kobold right here. And if you're not sure about how far your character can move, that's listed on your character sheet right here under Speed. We can see that Valeros can move 25 feet, which is 5 squares. He's got plenty of movement to walk up to that kobold. Now once he's walked up to the kobold, he'll attack. And so to do that, we're going to scroll down to the Melee Strikes section here. And this lists out all the different attacks that Valeros can make. We're going to have Valeros attack with his longsword. So we can just click on the word longsword here, and the attack results display over on the right-hand side of the screen in the chat. You'll notice that you have the attack roll itself, along with the weapon properties, the damage and damage type, and the critical damage. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, a critical hit occurs if you beat a creature's AC by 10 or more. And in this case, the Kobold's AC is an 18, and we rolled a 29. So that means we got a critical hit on this Kobold. And that's just a fantastic way to start off the, the game here with our first attack. So the Kobold is going to take 10 points of slashing damage from our critical hit. 
So Valeros has moved and attacked. He spent two actions. He has one action remaining, and he decides he's going to swing at the kobold again. But instead of clicking on longsword again, we're going to click on this number two button. Each attack you make after the first one has a penalty applied to it. And by clicking on the number two button, it automatically makes that attack roll and deducts the penalty. So if I hover over this attack two roll, we'll see that there's a minus five that's been included in the calculation. That's the penalty that was automatically included in the attack. So now my kobold here takes another seven points of slashing damage because it's not a critical hit. I didn't beat their AC by 10 or more. So they take seven more points of slashing damage. So now I'm gonna tell my GM that I am done with my turn and we will advance to the next creature in the turn order. The next creature in the turn order is this kobold right here. And this kobold is going to attack Valeros. So it's going to lash out at Valeros with its claws. And we can see that the kobold rolled a 12 for its attack. So we're going to compare that to our character's AC. Your AC can be found up here in the top center portion of your character sheet. And you're going to see there are two numbers here. There's AC and shield. Your AC includes things like your armor, your proficiency, and your dexterity modifier. And your shield is your overall AC plus your shield bonus. The thing to know here is you only get to add your shield to your AC if you specifically used an action to raise your shield. So Valeros has three actions on his turn, right? Let's say he used one to move up to the kobold, one to attack the kobold, and then he could have used the last action to raise his shield. And that would put the shield now between him and his opponent so he would get the shield bonus. But if you remember, on our turn, we didn't do that. We had Valeros move and then he attacked twice. So our shield is still down by our side and isn't impeding our opponent. So we won't add our shield to our overall AC right now. And we're just going to use the 19 value rather than a 21. And even so, it doesn't really matter because the kobold only rolled a 12 and they missed. So now our kobold has spent one of its actions. It's going to take a five foot step to get a little bit away from Valeros. And then it's going to throw a thunderstone at him and it's going to throw it so that it hits this wall over here. Now I've just dropped the description of a thunderstone into the chat. And the upshot here is that it's going to deal 1d4 sonic and one sonic splash damage to each creature within 10 feet of where the stone exploded. So Valeros is gonna get hit with it, but no one else will. So now my DM rolls for damage and we see that Valeros is gonna take two points of sonic damage plus one point of splash damage for three points total. So we can deduct the three by clicking on his token and then typing in minus three and that updates his HP accordingly. We can confirm that by going back to his character sheet and we can see over here in the hit points section, his HP max is 24, but he's currently at 21. And we see there's also a bit here that says Valeros must succeed at a fortitude saving throw DC 17 or be deafened. So to make that fortitude saving throw, we'll go back into our character sheet and we're going to scroll down here to the saving throws section and we'll click fortitude. And we can see that Valeros rolled an 18, so he's fine. But let's say that he had failed, if he had gotten, say, a 16. Well, in that case, he'd be deafened. And to remember that, what we can do is click on the deafened condition here over on the right-hand side of the screen. And that adds the condition to our character's current status. And if we click on this down-facing arrow, we can see a description of that particular condition. As you can see here, deafened gives you a negative two status to initiative checks based on perception. And that negative two is automatically calculated in your character sheet. So if we finished this combat and Valeros was still deafened at the time when the next combat started, we'd roll initiative again and you would see that the negative two was being included in the roll. But once the appropriate duration is passed, you can just remove a condition by clicking on it again. Now, sometimes a condition will have a numerical value associated with it. So, for example, maybe your GM tells you that your character now has the sickened one condition. So when you select sickened, this text box appears to the right of that condition where you can enter the number one. So this would be sickened one. And reading the description of this, what that means is you will take a negative one penalty to all your checks for the duration. 
So when we type in the number one and press enter here, we can see now that we have a negative one that's being applied to all of our skill checks automatically for us. And again, once the duration of the condition has expired, we can click on it to remove it and all of our skills go back to their normal values. And speaking of skill checks, if you want to make a check, all you need to do is click on the name of the skill and the sheet will roll it for you. Okay, so we've seen melee combat from Valeros, but how about magic? Well, conveniently enough, it's Ezrin the Wizard's turn now. And Ezrin's got a couple of kobolds that he's dealing with, and he wants to move up and hit them with a Burning Hands spell. So Ezrin is going to spend one of his actions to step forward, and then let's open up his character sheet. Again, we'll Alt-Double-Click to do that, and we'll resize it. And what we're going to do is go over to the Spells tab, and this shows us all the spells that Ezrin currently has access to. So what we're going to do is come down here to Burning Hands, and we can see that Burning Hands uses two actions. So Ezrin has spent an action to move, and now he's going to spend his remaining two actions to cast Burning Hands. So we're going to click on that, and that puts the spell's output into the chat, just like it did with Valeros' attacks. And we can see here that the spell is going to deal 8 fire damage, or it may deal 12 fire damage, if our kobolds fail their reflex saving throw by 10 or more. So this will deal 8 damage, it may deal 12 damage. And then it lists out information like how many actions the spell cost, what you have to do in order to cast it, and then a brief description of the spell itself. So now the kobolds would make their saving throws, take the appropriate amount of damage, and then once the spell has been cast, we want to deduct the appropriate spell slot from the spell slots per day section over here on the left side of the sheet. Now, while you're here, if your GM ever asks you what your spell save DC is, that's listed right here along with your spell attack bonus. As you saw, that's automatically included in the spell attack roll, so you don't need to really worry about that, but just in case you ever need it, it's right there. Additionally, if your character has innate spells, like maybe they're a Dompier who can cast Charm as an innate spell, or maybe you're a monk who has focus spells, those can be enabled by flipping these switches on right here, and that adds those to your character sheet. And you can add new spells to any of these sections just by dragging and dropping them from the compendium. So let's add Charm to our innate spells. I'm going to click on the compendium, I'll search for charm. Here's the charm spell. I can just drag that right into the innate spells section. That highlights, drop it, and now we could cast it. Now, if you make a mistake or you'd like to remove an item from the sheet, click this lock icon, and then you can click on this red trash can to remove the entry, and then click the lock icon again. And this drag and drop concept and the lock icons apply to a lot of other parts of the character sheet as well, which we'll see in just a minute. Okay, so we've talked about initiative, melee combat, and spell casting. Let's talk through some of the other parts of your sheet now. This details tab is where you track information about your character's personality and backstory. The feats tab is where you track all the feats your character can perform. Like spells, feats can be dragged and dropped from the compendium. So we can add this counterspell feat just by dragging and dropping it into our character sheet. And then you can click this downward facing arrow to read a description of the feat. The inventory tab is where all your character's possessions are tracked. And like spells and feats, items can be added to your inventory by dragging and dropping. So let's add a staff to Ezrin's possessions here. And we just want a plain old staff. I'm just going to drag that onto his held items section. And when I do that, it automatically adds the staff as an attack over here on the melee strikes section of the character tab. And you can also add things like armor and shields into the worn items section and that will automatically update the appropriate modifiers to your AC. The alchemy tab is used if your character is an alchemist. And just like with the spells and feats, you can drag and drop items onto this section as well. So maybe our character is an alchemist who can craft lesser acid flasks. We can go up to the compendium here. We can search for Lesser Acid Flask, drag that, drop it on here, and then we can throw it 
by clicking on its name. So it acts just as an attack or a spell. And we can see that over here, uh, just like with the attacks and spells that we've seen previously, we get all of that information put into chat. And then finally, the options tab is where you can configure certain other features of the sheet. Honestly, I'd recommend you leave most of these alone, but I suppose if your character isn't an alchemist, you could probably turn off the show alchemy tab and call it good. So now that we've talked through how to use the sheet, the last thing I want to do is show you how you would create a new character from scratch. And this is going to be a very short version. I'm just going to highlight a couple of key things that you're going to want to know as you make your new character. So I'm just going to close out of Ezrin's sheet here. I'm going to go over to the journal and I've got a new blank character sheet that has been assigned to me by my GM for my character that I'm naming Runji. When you start this out, all of your stats will be set to their default. So you can go through and you can fill in information about your ancestry and heritage, the deity that your character worships and so on. But to do things like set your ability scores, what you're gonna wanna do is hover over them and click on the little cog that appears in the left. And then we can say what our character's base score is. So let's say that our character's base score is gonna be a 16 for strength. We'll close that. And then we'd go through and repeat that process for our dexterity and then all the other items as well. When we get into our saving throws, what you're gonna wanna do is click on the cog here and in your class description in the Pathfinder core book, it will tell you whether or not you are trained, untrained, an expert, whatever level it is you have in a particular save. So let's say that Runji here is going to be trained in fortitude. You see that makes him T3. That means he's trained in the save. And if you look at the top left corner of your sheet, it'll say that trained is two plus your level. So he's a level one character. We add two to that, we get three. If we change this to expert, you see that becomes E5, and that's because expert is four plus your level. So when you see T3 or say M7, it defines both your rank in the particular save or skill and the numeric value that will be added to the rolls for that save or skill. So speaking of skills, it's gonna be the same thing for all of your skills. You'll come through here, you'll fill in whether you are trained, untrained, expert, or so on in each of your skills. Then you'll want to go through, add all of your weapons and spells like we saw earlier, as well as any other actions that your character may have as a result of your class. And again, you can just click on this cog here to put in the name of the action, how it gets activated, and so on. And the same approach applies when you level up as well. You'd go through, look at the core book, figure out, okay, have my saving throws improved? Have my skills improved? Do I get an ability bonus? Do I get a new feat? Whatever it is, you can add those to your sheet and then continue on. And there you have it. That's how to navigate the Pathfinder 2nd Edition character sheet on Roll20. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a like and share it with your players. And until next time, folks, have a great day.